Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you here uh, this morning. Uh, what a wonderful day it is to come together to be able to worship God and spend time uh, gathering around the Lord's table as well as singing songs of praise to, uh, to God. Before I get into my lesson, I want to share with you some things about virtual church. As you know, we have been in virtual church now uh, for almost six, six months. And over this period of time, it could be that you are really starting to get really tired of it that it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating, especially when you think about all the things that you're having to do in your work. A lot of you uh, at work are working at home, but you're having to do Zoom meetings, so you're all day on the computer doing Zoom meetings, or now school is going to begin, uh, teachers and students are going to be on Zoom and trying to meet that way, and so there's a lot of virtual things going on, and it becomes frustrating, and it becomes tiring to some of us, and, and we get to thinking about virtual church, and we think to ourselves, you know, that's the last thing I really want to do because everything is centered around it other than the fact that we are coming together on Sunday morning with a limited few of us. Now we're able to put 50 in the auditorium and 50 more in the, in the remote service and we're able to do that two times for a total of about 200 people. But our congregation is one of about 470. And so when you look at those kinds of numbers, a lot of things have to happen uh, uh, virtually. So we're having online string and worshiping assemblies, parking assemblies, Zoom meetings, Zoom Bible classes, Zoom team meetings, Zoom elder meetings, Zoom deacon meetings, Zoom missionary meetings, Zoom, 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 Zoom to the point we're going, ugh, I'm, I'm done with this stuff here. But, but don't let it. Let me encourage you to... Uh, Stay involved with our Bible classes that uh, Clint's teaching on Sunday evening as he talks about Nehemiah and the rebuilding of walls. Listen, there's a lot of rebuilding that has to go on in the, in the world, but in the body of Christ as well as we get back to a more of a, a normalcy. And so let me encourage you to, to get online on Sunday evenings and then on Wednesday evenings as Larry talks about how to be happy in this life. And so those are valuable classes. And I know you might be saying, well, you know what? Uh, I don't need that stuff. Okay, maybe you don't need it, which I, I doubt, uh, but those who are online do need it. They need to be able to see your faces and know that you are involved. And so let me encourage you to stay connected if you're not able to get out of your house. So stay connected uh, to the church and to one another, uh, virtually speaking. It will be a blessing uh, to you unless you're just a really strong Bible student and study on a real regular basis in an in-depth kind of way. Um, then okay, but other than that, uh, a half hour uh, uh, on a Sunday morning or an hour on Sunday morning is just not enough to strengthen you and to build you and to nourish you, spiritually speaking. And so take advantage of the Zoom meetings. Uh, just a couple of events that I want to remind you of is remember our virtual prayer summit on October the 18th. And then uh, remember, we're going to have a campfire devotional on September the 27th. We're going to do some singing and praying out here in the south uh, parking lot and a lesson and some fellowshipping together with one another. So bring a, uh, a lawn chair and a smiling face and those kinds of things. It will be a good time together with one another. Let me begin by talking to you a little bit about coal mining. Hopefully it's going to make sense as we go along because you might be thinking that's a strange thing to start off a sermon with about a coal mining. Did you know that coal mining is one of the major, major industries in the world today? And what surprised me when I got to looking at it is that coal mining provides almost 45% of the world's electricity. 45% of the electricity that comes into our homes is provided because of uh, coal mines and the coal that comes out of the ground. There's a fellow by the name of, uh, of Curtis Burton. He is 47 years old. He's been a coal miner for about 17 years. He was doing an interview, and in this interview, he was talking about coal mining, and he said about coal mining these words. He was saying that coal mining is a dark, it's dirty, and it is a dangerous work. And few people really want to get involved in, in coal mining. Even though it's a major industry, few people want to go into the, the abyss, go d deep down into the earth where few men, he says, see anything like that. If you want to do that, but it's a, it's a natural thing, and it's something that is a needed thing. When you think about coal mines, generally when we think about coal mines, we think about the east in West Virginia or Pennsylvania where there's a lot of coal mines, but few think of Wyoming as being a place of coal deposit, and yet the largest coal fields in the United States is in the Powder Basin, of Wyoming. In fact, the largest coal mine in the United States out of those 863 coal mines, the largest one is the North Antelope Rochelle coal mine uh, in central Wyoming that has a coal uh, field that goes almost all the way up to the north of the state around 
uh, Gillette, Wyoming, which I think is called the Big Thunder Mountain that is up there. And so coal is everywhere. But coal is a, a to dig that stuff out is a dark and dirty and dangerous work. And he himself said few people want to go down into that place. So there's about 53,000 coal miners that descend into the bowels of the earth thousands of feet deep to extract what they call black gold. It's called black gold because, like I said, it provides 45% of the world's uh, electricity. But it's more than just that. If I were to go down and talk to you about all the things that comes out of coal mining, you'd be absolutely amazed at how important coal mining is. And that's why it becomes a political a thing that is tossed back and forth between various political parties. It's an important part of our, our country. Well, one of the things that Burton said about coal mining is this. He says, you cannot walk through a coal mine without getting dirty. And he talks about the dangers of it. He talks about the collapses in the mine. He talks about uh, people um, getting caught up in fires below ground or even drowning because of breaking into a, 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 a line or a line or a cave and it having water in it and it drowning men within it or just a black lung disease that comes out of it itself. So he says it's a dark, it's a dirty, it's a dangerous place to work and no one can walk through it without getting dirty. And I got to thinking about that, about getting dirty and I thought about our world. Our world, in many ways, is a dark, a dangerous, and a dirty place to live. And there are very few who are able to go through this life without, it being, without themselves being touched. For instance, behind me is a picture of comedian Tim Allen of, of Home Improvement, is most where his fame comes from. Tim Allen was once interviewed uh, by a, a news agency after, or an interview, after uh, his father had died in an automobile accident. And these were his words. I never really recovered. The world's a mean place. It's unfair. Then it's fair. It's hateful. Then it's loving. It's a very peculiar place on a philosophical and metaphysical and religious levels. I love human beings because we're very courageous in the, the particular place that we live, reality. And so notice some of the words that he uses to speak about our world. He says that it is mean. He says it's unfair. He says that it can be hateful. It can be all those kinds of things in our world. That's his estimation. And so he says, you know, that it's confusing sometimes in, in life. Another fellow, Bertrand Russell here, Bertrand Russell is no friend of Christianity, certainly no friend of God. He is a noted or renowned uh, atheist that oftentimes railed against God and Christianity. Here's his conclusion of what the world in which we live in is. He said these words, The life of man is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by the weariness and pain towards a goal that few can hope to reach and where none can tarry long. One by one, as they march, our comrades vanish from our sight, seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death. Brief and powerless is man's life. On his and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls, pitiless and dark. Blind to the good and evil, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on into relentless, in, in its relentless way. For man, condemned today to lose his dearest, tomorrow himself to pass through the gates of darkness, it remains only to cherish, ere yet the blow falls, the lofty thoughts that ennoble his little day. I mean, that is almost depressing to think about a person that looks at life that way because there is no hope in his life. There's nothing in this life but it would be the meanness and hatefulness and difficulties of this, this world. So it can be, be, be depressing like that. But the truth is, is most, if not all, would agree that the world is a dark, it is a dangerous and a dirty place to live, and it's extremely difficult to walk through in this, this world without getting dirty. You're thinking to yourself, where is this, where is this coming from? Well, remember last week I shared with you that one of the qualities of the seven that Peter talks about over in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7 he lays out for us seven qualities, and the fifth quality, you remember last week, is that of godliness. And I said to you, if you were to give a simple definition of what godliness is, well, the simple definition, it means a devotion to God. And I got to thinking about devotion to God and the, 
the question came into my mind is, how does a Christian stay devout to God in a corrupt world without getting dirty? How do we live in a world without, without allowing it to affect us in some really strong ways? So the lesson this morning is called Devoted to God. Living for God in today's world without getting dirty. I think that's so important to address that. Some answer that, well, the way you go through this world without getting dirty is you need to isolate yourself away from the world itself. Hence, you have the mon monastic movement or monasteries where monks will go up on the top of a mountain on the edge of a cliff and wall themselves in so that the world can't come in and, and hurt them. And that seems to almost you know irrefutable logic that that seems to make sense except that it flies in the face of what god's word says for us that we're not to isolate and i don't know about you but i'm done with this isolation stuff i'm tired of being isolated after going through it six months i can't imagine living a life where you're isolated from the rest of the world around you well here's what the bible says paul writing to the philippians in philippians 2 and verse 15 says Prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights to the world. So we live in a crooked and perverse generation. And yet Paul says that we are to be blameless, that we are to be innocent children of God who live in the midst of it, that we are the lights to the dark world in which we live. Jesus in his high priestly prayer over in John the 17th chapter as he was and talking to his disciple or praying to God about his disciples he first prayed for himself then he prayed for the apostles then he prayed for us as a church and here's what he said Jesus says, I have given them your word the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one Notice what Jesus said to the Father or prayed to the Father. He says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I have given them the word. Thy word will sanctify them. It will set them apart. I've given them uh, the word, but don't take them out of the world. Why is that? Because a world that is dark and dangerous is a world that needs light. And that's who we are. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And so it becomes who we are. And so he says, don't take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one now over in ephesians the sixth chapter verses 11 and 12 paul says we're not ignorant of the schemes of the devil we know that there are forces of wickedness and evilness that surrounds us in this world in the unseen world as well as the the reality or the physical world in which we live and yet jesus says don't take them out of the world i've put them in to the world protect them take care of them so here's what we want to look at this morning. I want us to look at three things. The first one is this, is I want to give you a brief analysis of the world in which you live. Number two, I want to give you a strong challenge to be different from the world. And then three, let me, I'll share with you several ways that we can stay devout and clean in this, this world. So let's begin by this first one, a brief analysis of the world. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the general epistle found over in First John, the second, chap the second chapter. And let's just notice verses 15 through 17. First John 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not of the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who do does the will of God abides forever. So when you look at that passage of Scripture, by world, he's not talking about the planet on which we live. What he's talking about is he's talking about a philosophy that encapsulates the mindset and the morality of the unregenerated. By unregenerated, I'm talking about those who are lost. I'm talking about those who are not filled with the Spirit. I'm talking about those who have not given their lives over to God. And so by world, he's talking about a philosophical motivation that is out there that is there to disrupt our lives in, in, in incredible ways. And so uh, John says, don't love the world, nor the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. The, the world is going to dangle out before you a lot of bling, 
a lot of things that you that you're going to want the desires that are natural for man to possibly uh, want and yet in order to survive and yet he says be careful of of that when he talks about philosophy and the world the word world that he uses here is the word cosmos it's an ordered system in the context we're talking about an ordered system which satan is the head and that's why i mentioned just a little bit ago ephesians uh, chapter 6 verses 11 and and 12. it's the unseen world the spiritual world that is working behind the scenes that we don't know what exactly is going on there but it's it, it's happening and then there is the unsaved world of the human race and much of this world system well it can look pretty good it's religious it's cultured it's refined it is intellectual but it is anti-god and anti-christ it is much like paul uh, over in act the 17th chapter who was speaking on at mars hill in athens he talks about the world in which uh in which those people lived at that time notice chapter 17 and verse 16 if you will now while paul was waiting for them at athens his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of, of idols. And then he talks about that beginning in verse 22. He says, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For I, while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, I proclaim uh, to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples uh, made with hands. So he, he talks about this world and he says the world in which they're living clear back then. In Athens, he says it's a religious world. It's a refined world, it's an intellectual world, it's a cultural world, but it's an anti-God and an anti-Christ world. And so the Athenians, in order to capture all the gods, and some of them were really bad gods and nasty people to do really bad and evil things, he says there is an inscription to an unknown God, and that's the one I want, you to, want to talk to you about. But they weren't into it, and as you get to the end of the discussion, you'll find out that they said, you're a seed picker, you're a babbling nut is what you are in talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's, to, at least to some degree, the world in which you live. It's a philosophical thing that is hard to put your finger completely on. In fact, R.C. Trench, he said these words, he's a commentator. He says, the world of the unsaved humanity is inspired by the spirit of the age. All that floating mass of thoughts, opinions, maxims, speculations, hopes, impulses, aims, aspiration, at any time current in the world, which it may be impossible to seize and accurately define. In other words, it's hard to get a hold of it completely. He says, but, which constitutes a most real and effective power, being the moral or immoral atmosphere, which at every moment of our lives we inhale again inevitably to exhale. So this world, is, that's the world system that John is talking about when he says, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. It's a temporary thing. They're only going to be here for a while. They promise something that they cannot produce. And then there is the motivation. The world motivates us by appealing to our pride or the things that please us. And that's why uh, John will write, you know, uh, do not fall into the world because it, it's all about the lust of the eyes, uh, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. It holds things out there that are according to our desires that can ultimately harm us spiritually speaking. M.R. Vincent, who is also a Bible commentator, says the sum total of human life in the order of the world considered part from, apart from, alienated from, and hostile to God and of earthly things which seduce us. So there are things that are there that are to seduce us or bring us away from God, and that is Satan's goal. Satan's goal is to separate us from God, not to draw us closer to, but to separate us from. And not only does it separate us from him, it separates us from one another as, as well. If you want an idea of how dark and dangerous and dirty this world is well romans the first chapter gives you a, a really good idea of just how bad our our world truly 
is in which we live. And if it was true back in Paul's day, well, you can know for sure it's true even in our own. Listen to verse, beginning in verse 28. And just as they did not, and it gets, I mean, it's really bad ahead of this, but I'm just trying to give you a, a taste of what we're talking about. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind, a reprobate mind, to do, do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And it doesn't get any better when you get to 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. That's the world, the di dirty, dark, and dangerous place that we live. Which brings us to the passage of Scripture that Dave read to us just a few moments ago from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through uh, 21. So there's an analysis of the world that I just shared with you now let's talk about a strong challenge to be different, and that's what Peter does in our primary text uh, this morning out of 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, or uh, yeah, chapter 1. Listen to what he says. Now, as we look at those passages of Scripture, I want you to think about gravity. The pull of the world is every bit as strong and subtle as gravity. Most of us, when we think about gravity, we don't think much about it. I mean, I don't go through the day thinking about gravity, but it's there all the time, right? When you talk about gravity, it's invisible, it's irresistible, it is relentless, and it is never absent, and it's never passive. It's always there. And if you don't think it's not always there, then, you know, climb up to about a nine-story building where you're about 100 feet off the ground and look over the side and when you're looking up from the ground at the 100 feet it doesn't look all that bad until you look from 100 feet down then it looks really a long ways down and if you don't think gravity works just step off it and you'll get a good lesson for a brief moment of how strong gravity is it's constantly there it's irresistible you cannot go against it uh, it's relentless it's never absent and it's never passive and that's the way the world is. The world around us is constantly there pulling us, and it is something that is strong. And yet Peter says that we are to live lives that are, are holy. Look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, and notice what he, he says here. He says in verse 15, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am, am holy. So unless we realize how strong and how subtle the world's influence, our, our Paul really is, we won't understand the passion that is behind uh, Peter's words. I mean, he has been really serious about the world in which uh, we live. And what he's saying is, he's saying, now is not the time to kick back. Now's not the time to get lax or to get, to get lazy. Because he says, you need to be girding your minds. You need to keep sober in spirit. You need to make sure you are fixing your hope on God. Look at verse 13. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we are to be ready for this thing. We are to stay ready. And he says, and we are to be holy. That word holy, in simple terms, means to be set apart. As Christians, we're to be set apart in some special, exclusive kind of way. Maybe a way to explain it to you would be to talk about marriage. Uh, there's a lot of men and women. But when we decide that we're going to get married, we choose one woman or one man out of all the women and men that we could choose to exclusively give our lives to, devote our lives totally to. So when I chose Lori about 46 years ago, I chose her. Out of all the other girls that were around me, she's the one I chose, and I devoted my life to her, and she has done the same. So marriage becomes something that is a set-apart kind of, of contract. Or the communion that we took 
uh, this morning. <clears throat> Though there, it's a simple little wafer or kosher cracker, unleavened bread, or just a little sip of juice, uh, there was a lot of crackers that are out there and a lot of juice that is out there. But we take and we set aside this small portion that we call the Lord's Supper and we partake of it. And in doing so, it becomes something that is set apart or, or holy because we were remembering uh, Jesus and what he has done for, for us. First Peter 3 and verse 15 says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense about the hope that is in you. To sanctify Christ means to set him apart. It's a verb in that sense there, that we are to set Christ apart as one who is exclusive to us and who drives our lives and makes our lives abundant and better. He also talks in verse 17 about how we are to conduct ourselves. Look at verse 17. And if you address the Father as the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth. I don't know if fear is the best word to be used here. I think maybe a good option is the word reverence. And so Peter says that we are to conduct ourselves in a manner that reflects our reverence for God, our respect for, for God. And he tells us why at the beginning of that verse, he says, there is a judgment of which all are going to stand before the judgment seat of God, and we're going to answer for the works that we have done in our, our flesh. So there is a warning of judgment. And the warning is that even after we have walked, we can lose our salvation. So we need to conduct ourselves in a way that reflects the holiness of God in our lives and our reverence or our respect, maybe even, even our fear of God god it could be tantamount though this is probably a weak illustration of uh a, an olympian who wins a gold medal who uh is disqualified or stripped of it because a test revealed that he was on steroids the guy behind you is ben johnson ben johnson in 1987 in seoul korea won the 100 meter dash Carl Lewis was the guy to beat in that day. And this guy, a Canadian runner, he beat Carl Lewis in the 100 meter, setting a world record, was given the gold medal, and then later they found out that he was doping. He was human, human growth or, uh, hormones of some type. And the result of that was he was stripped of his gold medal. Now, did Ben Johnson train? Did Ben Johnson exercise? Did he discipline himself to run in the race? Did he not, in fact, run the race and win the race? The answer is, is yes to all these things. But he had no reverence for the Olympic rules. He didn't conduct himself in a way that reflected the rules of the Olympiad. And the result of that was he was disqualified. That's what P P Peter is saying. That we can get in the race, we can run the race, we can go to church, we can do all those things and then dis become disqualified if we do not live godly and holy lives that are completely devoted to God in every way. Then he talks about focusing our minds on Christ in verses 18 through 21. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of us. And so the only way to be emancipated from this slavery of sin that we find ourselves caught in is someone had to redeem us. Someone had to purchase us. Someone had to pay a ransom price. And that's why that song, before I got over it, was so incredibly beautiful when it talked about the precious blood of Jesus because the price that was paid uh, by Christ it was not silver or gold, but he says, but with the precious blood of the lamb, unblemished, unstained, spotless. He lived the life perfectly. He walked through this world, this coal mine of life, with not getting even so much as a smudge on him. And because of that, he becomes the perfect perfect sacrifice for our sins then he reminds us that the first thing christ did for us was deliver us from slavery slavery from a futile way of life the things that the world promises us the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes but also pride of life 
You can write a blank there and put anything you want under any one of those things. And at the end of the day, it's going to become futile because no one takes those things to the grave. The only thing you take to the grave with you is your faith and your relationship uh, with, with Christ. And that has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. The second thing is that Christ did uh, for, uh, did for us, what he did for us was he came into our, our world so that we would know him. And that's what he says there in verse 20. And what that means is this. It means that Jesus literally and willingly stepped out of all the preciousness of heaven, all the benefits of heaven to pay the ransom for us, to pay a heavy price. Philippians 2 in verse 5 says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, I mean, a bond servant, being made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He died on the cross, purchased us, bought us with his blood. Acts 20 and verse 28 and 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. It says that we have been bought with a price, that the church, you and me, have been purchased with his blood and because of that we have hope we have been given a hope we're not like Bert, Bert, Bertrand Russell who has no hope we have hope that at the end of this life we have something far greater ahead of us so very quickly let's talk about some ways to stay devout to God uh, in a corrupt world without getting dirty this is a fairly short part of the sermon it'll only take about 30 minutes or so so just stay with me. Number one is pay close attention to what you look at. If you don't want to get dirty, pay close attention to what you give your eyes to. That's talking about the things you watch on TV, the things you watch on movies, the things that you are uh, binging on out of Netflix. Uh, it includes the things that you read. Your eyes. Your eyes are a gateway to your soul. It's a gateway to who you, you are. So pay close attention to what you look at. I think that's bad English to leave a dangling participle there, but never mind, don't worry about that. Number two, give greater thought to the consequences of sin rather than its pleasure. Sin promises you a lot, <clears throat> but it's usually for just a, a moment. And far too often we give away too much uh, for a moment of satisfaction only to pay a heavy price at the end. So. Give greater thought to the consequences of sin rather than to its pleasures. Number three, start each day renewing your sense of devotion and reverence to God. Wake up thinking about God. Wake up being determined that you're going to be devoted to God and live according to his will. And then finally, periodically during each day, intimately focus on Christ. Hebrews 12 and verse 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of our faith. So Fix your eyes on Jesus where, where he's sitting at the right hand of God. If we will do these four things, then we can walk through this life without getting its dirt on us. Pay close attention to what you look at. I guess we could have said pay close attention to what you listen to as well. That's another gateway. Uh, give greater thought to the consequences of sin rather than just its pleasure. Start each day renewing a sense of devotion and reverence for God and periodically during each day keep your eyes fixed on the one who didn't get a smudge and if you do that then you can experience what it is like to be in a world but not of it and not only that then you can walk through the coal mine of the world and not get dirty so the lesson is yours you can be devout in a dark and dirty and dangerous place Paul says we can, Jesus says we can, Peter says we can, and now let's, let's just do it as followers of his. The lesson is yours. If you need to respond in any way, won't you do so at this time? Let's all stand. And I